they put three in one and one in the other one, then they will get confused by thinking, but you had one go through one. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Next week, we'll hear from Dr. Imler, who will talk about organic semiconductors. If you're wondering what that is, don't ask me. Wait until next week. Your questions will be answered. Also, please note that the last speaker in our colloquium series, Jacob Applebaum, is uh, the focus of great interest, both by dark forces and friends, especially those who have corresponded with him extensively since, who knows, maybe I am next on the list. Anyway, look him up. He, uh, there is an article in uh, various Wall Street Journal and all kinds of other CNET and so forth. Today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Jonathan Smolensky. If you looked up Smolensky, it's a city in Russia, but that's not what we're talking about here. He was a student in class, in our classes, in our major, and he graduated a few years ago, although it may seem like a long, long time ago. And he is today here to introduce us to biometrics. So let's welcome him. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Smolensky, as Professor Lydian said. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. I come from the biometrics industry, which if you guys did your Googling, like I know you're supposed to for all these colloquiums and write on the back of your little type up. Um, biometrics is taking human characteristics and using them to essentially identify unique individuals. That's what we do in biometrics. So I come from a company called Cogent. Cogent is one of the three largest biometric security firms in the world. They're based in uh, Southern California, out of Pasadena. Uh, there are two others. One is NEC, which you may have seen their monitors, their, their uh, hardware, computer hardware. They're out of Japan. And the uh, third one is called uh, Sajin. They're a French company. And these three companies, by themselves, corner about 95% of the biometric market in the world. They're, they're absolutely gigantic. So, <coughs> biometrics. There are two types of biometrics. The one we're going to concentrate on are the physiological biometrics. This includes things like your fingerprints, your toe prints, your iris, your footprints themselves, uh, ear prints. They actually do scanning of the ear. And everyone's ear is a little bit different than the others. You can actually identify someone based on what their ears look like, which is kind of neat. Um, and their facial structure. I'm sure you guys have seen uh, CSI, something like that. There's like three or four of those series, and you've seen the, the screens where you know they capture a fingerprint from a crime scene, and they send it in, and they have a facial image, and the other side flashes really quick, and you know eventually stops on someone's face. That doesn't happen. That never happens. That's stupid. Um, what happens is, if you program the program before, you know everything happens in the background, and when it's finished, you get some output. So. Unfortunately, I don't have anything flashy. I kept telling the guys at work, please design something like this, because this will sell. People love this stuff. They don't know what fingerprints are. They love to see fingerprints you know, flashing on the screen, and they just won't. <coughs> the other type of biometrics are behavioral biometrics. Now, this includes things like uh, the way you walk. Everyone walks slightly differently. I'm sure you, you've you know, got a friend who has that very distinctive walk, and when you see them coming from hundreds and hundreds of feet away, you know it's them just because of the way they're you know, sauntering, like they haven't to care in the world or whatever. They're almost falling over. Um, and for some reason, I, I don't know why exactly, voice structure falls into behavioral biometrics. Um, you can identify people based on their voice as well. So the different types. There's a reason that we focus on fingerprints in this world. The first type, the, I guess most science fiction you want right now is the iris capture. So we have devices that will capture your eye, and you, you've seen them in movies. You look in a little thing, and it captures, and it says, oh, Colonel, whatever it is, and it lets them into the super security room, whatever, to pilot a jet, something. Um, they're difficult to capture. Not in that it's difficult to take a picture of the iris, but it's very hard for you to look at me and look at my eyes and then recall what it looks like later. Very difficult. If I move over here, all of a sudden my eyes aren't there. It, it's not easy to leave your eye prints behind or something like that. So it's okay for things like 
um, access control for getting into a room for identification if you have the person right there. But because the bulk of what we do <coughs> is uh, crime solving at Cogent, it's not so good for leaving an eye print at a crime scene. So this is, this is an up and coming technology, but it's not the focus. Uh, footprints. Footprints are also a little bit tricky. Footprints are tricky because your feet are usually inside your shoes, and if they're not, you know, you're walking on mud, on dirt, on sand, something like that, it's not easy to find a footprint. If you happen to step in someone's blood and track it through linoleum kitchen or something like that, then sure, you have a footprint you can capture. But because these are not particularly prevalent in most situations, we don't focus on footprints too much either. The one place you'll see footprints commonly is when a child is born, um, they will take the footprint of the child because babies are very hard to tell apart if you do nothing but look at babies all day. And there have been numerous situations where babies get swapped in the hospital and they identify them based on the footprints. Or they don't and then you go home with someone else's kid. <laughs> Facial images. <laughs> so, um, they're very easily captured. You can remember what I look like, I'm sure. Uh, you may not be able to exactly match that with something else, but I want to point out these two images are me, both of these. This is me at 15 years old, and this is me at 25 years old. And you can see there's a huge, huge difference between these two images right here. I gave these to our guys on the facial matching team, and I said, hey guys, match these. Tell me how accurate the system is. Take a look at these. And the system came back 17% chance that this is me. Now, I can tell the system, no, there's a 100% chance this is me, because I was there when we took these pictures. I recall this vividly. But it, it's not always easy to do this automatically. Now, they do have departments that concentrate on nothing but facial images. And they will look at things like the distance between the eyes. It will be the same. The eye to the nose, the top of the ear, the mouth. Mouth is tricky because if I smile there and I don't smile here because I was having a great day here. <laughs> um, the, obviously, you can't match the mouth right there. But, you know, you can look at chin if there's no beard. You can look at ears. You can look at eyes, things like that. And you can have a person get a fairly good idea that these are the same person. But a computer, not so much. It's, it's not quite there yet. So this is fairly new, too. And um, if any of you guys have gotten a, a license recently, they're actually starting to capture facial images when you do your license, and they tell you very strictly, they say, don't smile. They didn't say that when I was 25. This is brand new. But they don't want you to smile because they want to use that for facial matching in the event of, I don't know, what's the DMV do? Licenses, something. Um, if you're smiling, it, it throws off the whole thing. So it's easy to capture, but it's very difficult to match a face. So what we concentrate on are fingerprints. This is a fingerprint. Everyone has fingerprints. I'm sure you've seen yours. Um, <coughs> they're extremely easy to leave behind. I've left tens behind on this desk all over the place. If you came through here with some fingerprint powder, you could lift my fingerprints, and you could then, you know, frame me for a crime or something. I don't know what people do with fingerprints. But they're very, very easy to pick up on surfaces. Your hands are constantly filled with oils, lotions, all kinds of things that will leave and smudge especially on glass, something like that, that will leave a very distinct fingerprint that I can actually see with my eyes. I don't even have to lift it or scan it, do any kind of image modification. I can see all the little ridge detail, things like that. So that is why we focus on this for crime solving. It's also very handy to, solve, uh, to, to rely on fingerprints for things like access control. Um, so I'll go over the different types that we use. So, in the industry, we have the criminal departments. We have access control, which is things like, you know, a little fingerprint scanner, you scan your fingerprint, you walk into the door. We have immigration. If you guys have ever left the country and come back in, you'll see one of these little scanners at every single gate coming back in. And occasionally, they'll have you take your fingerprints. We actually built the system for them to do all the matching for the fingerprints. They don't use our scanners because this one's kind of, you know, questionable as far as quality goes. But they will. You said this is going on YouTube? Yeah. All right, never mind. These are fantastic scanners. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so much for that. Um, 
Sometimes they break. But uh, Guardian currently, I think, is the company that has the, uh, the, some of the best scanners in the world. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, but you'll see one of these little scanners at every single gate coming in. You'll see, actually, um, I think they may, in fact, use this exact camera. This is a very prevalent camera in the industry. Um, so that's why we focus on fingerprints. Easy to capture, easy to match. This is all easy. Yeah. Uh, as far as rate of uniqueness goes, um, so if you look at this fingerprint and you look at another fingerprint that has the same basic pattern, it may be difficult for you to tell right away that they're not the same fingerprint. I have to stress that this is the most important thing in this industry, is to tell that these are not the same person. All right? If you can prove that they are not the same, then there is no one in the world that can say that they are the same. A false positive saying that, yes, this is the same person, when in fact it isn't, is the most detrimental thing that an APHIS can possibly do, that a fingerprint operator can possibly do. Because there may be occasions where you are in control of somebody's life at this point. You're going to court, you're testifying, you're saying, yes, this is the same person. He murdered 50 people in a mini mall. If that's not the person, then all of a sudden you've taken that life into your hands. That, that's a huge thing to weigh in your conscience. So the most important thing for us as APHIS designers is to have no false positives. Now, false negative. What's APHIS? Sorry, I haven't gotten to the APHIS slide yet. So, <laughs> APHIS is what we call the, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. It's a little bit misleading. Um, it's very hard to have a computer convict somebody or not. So, I like to say Assisted Fingerprint Identification System. It will narrow down, out of the millions and millions of fingerprints out there, it will narrow down your prospects for the examiner to actually take a look at. So, little known fact, in most countries, in most systems, there is an 80% recidivism rate for criminals, which means if we don't get you this time, there's an 80% chance you're coming back. So, we don't focus entirely on getting every single bad guy, because we'll get you eventually. It's going to happen. Um, all right, so how do we actually match these biometrics? This is the same for every type of biometric. First, we capture the image. If you don't have an image to process, you can't do anything. Capture the image. Extract minutia. Minutia are unique points on the fingerprint that we can compare, or on the, the biometric image, that we can compare with other points to determine if this is the same person or not. All right, so. I'll go over a little bit more in detail what minutia are on fingerprints. Um, then we match them, of course. The computer system can do that. And then we have to confirm the hit. An operator has to confirm the hit when it is a, a, a criminal case, something like that. <coughs> All right, so step one, scan the fingerprint. We use a device like this. And this is a glass with a light and a camera inside, and if I touch this glass, I'll show you in our, our demonstration a little bit later, you'll actually see my ridges appear on the screen just as I touch the glass, just because they are then blocking the light from escaping. So you'll see shadows on this device. First, we capture the fingerprint. Next step, this is a little bit difficult to see, but we extract minutia. See this point right here where this ridge splits and becomes two ridges. This is a ridge by purification. We plot a minutia here. Two important things with the minutia are, here is the point, and here's the direction that it goes. All right, now, this is unique to all APHIS systems. The SAJM system is gonna plot it a little differently than a cogent system, which is gonna plot it differently than an NEC system, which is gonna plot it differently than a Motorola system, and so on and so forth. The way the cogent system does it is we plot, and we do direction like that. This is very important because this direction will help your system with the accuracy. If you're not plotting all your minutia the same way, then it's going to get very confused. For example, if we just decided we were going to plot one up here where there's no minutia at all, your system's not going to be able to match that. That's going to bring your accuracy down. So we have three types of minutia. We have bifurcation, we have a beginning ridge, and this, uh, I'm going to use this as an example, but it's not really. See this line here? It starts right here, it goes all the way down, and it ends right here. We have a break here. I'm not going to count that break, because this could be a piece of sand or dust or something like that on the scanner. So it's very important to me to be able to tell, okay, is this a smudge? 
is this just something on the scanner that didn't let my fingerprint capture? If I'm not sure this is a minutia, I'm not going to plot that because that's going to bring my, my accuracy down. So I know this is one. I know this is one. And this is a very long, I wouldn't even classify this as an island, but we'll call it an island for right now. An island is a short start and end, and you may have, like over here, I would say that's an island. So those are the three types. And that'll give us two minutia. Second, no, we're on third, right? This is number three. Third is we want to plot the core of the print, and we want to plot the delta. So what the core is, is it's the uh, center of your fingerprint. I'll go over the different types later, but each fingerprint has a center, one or two centers. Some of them may have some more centers, but we'll, we'll get to that at the end. <coughs> and then you have a delta. What a delta is, is it's a triangle type formation. You'll see it in this, in this whirl print <laughs> right here. We have one over here, and we actually have another one right here. And this is going to help us to determine that, okay, this is a whirl print because we have our center and we have our two deltas right there. That makes the shape a circle. All right, we'll go over the other shapes in just a little bit. So using those, we can actually determine what shape the fingerprint is. We can determine all the minutiae that we can use for matching. And we can actually use that delta and that core for matching as well. They're very similar to just regular minutia. So, these are a few of the types. This will cover 99% of the fingerprints. And you can look at your fingerprints and, and you'll see some of these patterns in here. The plain arch is a very shallow, kind of goes up and drops back down. All right? Very simple. It's like a rolling hill. It looks very relaxing. The tented arch goes up sharply and comes back down. We determine this a little bit differently because, as you can, as you can see here, there's not much in the way of, of triangles. There's not a whole lot of deltas right here. Over here, you can see we have a very sharp triangle right there. So that's going to determine these are two different types of fingerprints. This is the left slant, and then over here is the right slant. They're very similar. They go different ways, and they have one delta over there in the corner. We have our plain whirl. The whirl has two deltas, and it is a circular fingerprint. Double loop whirl. I've seen a few of these. These are not especially common, but this one looks kind of like a, a yin yang symbol, and it's got two deltas as well. What differentiates this from a regular whirl is that this would have one core, one red point right there in the middle. This one here will have two cores. So that one that we looked at before might be classified as a double whirl. This here could be anything at all. This is a accidental whirl. You can see it's got a little bit of the tented arch right there. It's got almost a loop, but it kind of goes in a circle, and there's some weird thing going on over here. This could be a scar, something like that. Something that's very important when you're looking at minutia. Scars, if they cut deep enough, they will become permanent in your fingerprints. I don't have a diagram of this, but I, I can explain how it works. Your epidermis is the outer layer of your skin. This is where your fingerprints show. If you cut this layer away, don't do it. Um, you have the layer underneath, which is actually where your fingerprints grow from. Unless you change that layer, your fingerprints will always come back. So that scene in Men in Black where Will Smith puts his fingers on the balls, that was stupid. That is, is completely wrong. His fingerprints would have grown back in like three weeks. So you can't remove your fingerprints unless you cut deep enough for it to hurt a lot. And there are people who have done this. Um, I'll talk about some of the, the little weird things that have happened in the industry at the end, but there was a, a, a lady who cut off the tips of her fingers deep enough to transplant them onto other fingers. <laughs> no, it, it's a horrible story. Um, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> so she actually swapped them around. I don't know what she did with a pinky, because I guess you could put it on the ring finger, but it's so small. So Anyway, um, she swapped them around. She thought it was absolutely brilliant, right? They'll never catch her again. Well, remember that 80% recidivism rate? They caught her again, and now she has new fingerprints in the system, so it sucks for her. That, that's, that's the biggest problem. Even if you do change your fingerprints, if you keep committing crimes, it's not going to matter because you're just going to have a new record. Okay. So, what if I have a country? Let's, let's roll back from country. Let's say, what if I have a city like Los Angeles? 
Los Angeles has 7 million people in it. All right? I don't know if you've ever been to Los Angeles, but a lot of these people are criminals. And we don't keep one record per person. Every time you get arrested and you get booked, we're going to create a new record in the system. So I may need a system that has upwards of 30 million records in it, just for this city of 7 million. I hope it's not that bad. I really do. Um, so what we need to do is we need to kind of filter this. Now you guys have all studied sorting, right? That's like 115 stuff, right? You know, you've made a list and you've separated it out and sorted it back together or, you know, bubble sort. Well, that doesn't work with 30 million fingerprint records because you've got 30 million people. You've got 10 fingerprints per person. What if they have six fingers? Then you're kind of screwed. Um, it's, it's too much work to do every single time you need to do a search. So what we can do is pick out things that are very noticeable, like eye color. We can say, okay, if your eyes are this color, then we can kind of filter out all the non-brown eyes and we can just concentrate on brown or concentrate on blue or concentrate on hazel. Or if your eyes change in the sunlight, then you get out of jail, whatever. Fingerprint pattern filtering is also very, very important. If you look at this, take a look at your fingerprints for just a moment. <coughs> Your fingerprints may not have the, the same pattern on every single finger. You're going to have a very, very unique combination of prints. For example, I have a loop, tented arch, tented arch, tented arch, tented arch. Loop, tented arch, tented arch, tented arch, tented arch. I'm almost positive not a single other person in this classroom has that pattern. And if you do, then I think we're we're one in like 45 million or something like that, it's, it's a very, very low chance. Your pattern is going to be very, very unique to you. Now, if you go through all 7 billion people in the world, I'm sure you'll find one or two people that have the same thing. But say we're doing a, an identification system for a country, it's very rare that you're going to find two people in that country that have the same thing. So we can actually use this as filtering. And this is going to cut out a ton of the work. And then there's patch filtering. So what is patch filtering? Patch filtering says, OK, suppose you and I have a tented arch on this finger. And I do, so I can say that. If we have a very similar pattern, we may have one finger that matches. It's not unheard of. I've had one finger that matches quite a few people. Um, if this finger matches, the odds of this finger matching are very, very low. So what I do is I patch the rest of the record. I match this finger, I match this finger, I match this finger, until I can say, no, this is not the same person. If all of them match, then OK, we got a hit. The last thing that we do is palm prints. This is a palm print. Now, if you look at your palm, you're not going to be able to find a whole lot of pattern in your palm. You're going to see a little bit up here in the inner digital area, and usually down here in the, the base of your palm. But for the most part, you're not going to be able to look at this and say, OK, I've got a double whirl helix uh, loop pattern on my palm, and you do too, so we're probably the same person. It doesn't work that way with palms. Palms are very, very complex to match. We actually have to separate this out, because if you think of the, the fingerprint, how you're doing the matching, you're doing a, a very small area. Now multiply that by 7 and 7, that's going to take forever. Palm searching is incredibly resource intensive. So we don't usually do palm searching unless it's absolutely necessary. We like to keep them on hand, because what if someone leaves a palm print at a, a crime scene, something like that? We can search that. It takes forever. But we don't do this for identification. This is strictly for criminal fingerprint searching. OK, so we already went across all this. Don't have to worry about that. Well, that's the other thing, background checks. If I guess most of you are computer science majors if you're in the colloquium, not so much teachers or something like that. But a lot of industries now, uh, teaching, um, school bus drivers, things like that, even security industries like to do background checks. They'll take your fingerprints and they'll search it. And we do those systems as well. Um, they're not actually searching against criminal databases at that point. Well. Depends on where you get search, I guess. But they will take your fingerprints. They'll send it to uh, a city or a national system, maybe the FBI's database, something like that. But you just want to make sure that you know you don't have anything too bad on your record. Okay, so Dustin, APHIS. This is the automatic fingerprint identification system. 
This does all of the steps that we just talked about automatically. This is where I come in. I'm not a fingerprint expert. I need to stress that heavily. I know what I've learned over the past couple of years just based on being on site at police stations across the world and talking with these people, you know, hearing stories about it. Not an expert. All right, I know the basics, the very minimum basics. I could not be called on in court to say, okay, yes, this is the same person. Essentially, my opinions legally hold no weight whatsoever. What I do is I actually construct the AFA system to do the matching. So this is, this is the, the area of my interest right here. So I'm interested in extracting minutia once the image is captured. I'm very interested in matching the biometrics. Secondary matching I especially like because that goes very quickly. And then we interface with remote stations to send and receive records. So if you're a police station, actually, you know, they have one here on campus. They have a cogent fingerprinting station here on campus or in the police station if you ever get arrested. Um, they will take you back there and they won't fingerprint you because I don't think they use it anymore. But it's back there in a locked room that you can't see. So just think of that next time you guys go to the police station. Um, they will scan your fingerprints and they will submit it via email, via FTP, they will encrypt it, send it over a web service, whatever method they've chosen to do, they will send it to probably, um, probably the FBI or something like that, or they may have a contract with another company that has an APHIS. We can actually make our APHIS interface with any sort of external scanning station. All right, no problem. We can send results back to it. So they may scan, send it off. A couple minutes later, they get a result. No, this person doesn't have a criminal record. Okay, great, make one. Done. All right, so to begin designing an APHIS, to break this up into the modules that we need to do, First, we have to have a module for collection. Right? Then, we have to manage the flow of this fingerprint. The reason we have to manage the flow is because not every single fingerprint is going to go the same way. All right? Your criminal fingerprint is not going to go the exact same way as your child identification fingerprint. It's not going to go the same way as your background check fingerprint. All right? So this right here has to control who it goes back to, where it comes from, all the things like that. Image processing. This is pretty standard, um, but it is very, very resource intensive. So to actually take an image, to look at every single pixel, to find the, the designs and the fingerprint, things like that, very, very difficult. So we have a separate server usually for that. Then we have our searching and our secondary matching. These are the two most important parts of the APHIS right here. This is what sets Cogent apart from the other companies, is that their searching speed is fantastic and their accuracy is impeccable. All right, this is the, these are the two areas that they do benchmarks of fingerprinting, searching and accuracy. All right? So here is a small APHIS system broken into servers. This is how many servers I need. I need at least five servers. I need a database of some sort. That looks good on the smaller resolution, doesn't it? That looks really nice. Um, and then I need a scanning station or multiple scanning stations. Now, this is a, a very, very loose representation of an APHIS. I may have an APHIS that has 15 region servers. So I'll explain what this is a little bit. A region server is like a state machine. Have you guys discussed state machines and how you know you have something and whether it's yes or no, you go to a different area? That's essentially all a region server is. So I get a print. I say, has it been scanned? No? OK. Or processed? No? Process it. Great. Send it back. OK. Has it been processed? Yes. Let's search. Send it to searching. OK. It's done searching. Has it been searched? For the second time, has it been patch searched? No? OK. I skipped a few. Uh, patch searched. Go ahead and do that. The region server controls everywhere that this fing fingerprint goes into the system. All right. The APHIS server is managing all the searching and all the database. This is the core of the system. That's why we call it the APHIS server. It's very, very confusing when you talk about an APHIS server versus an APHIS system. but that's what we're going to do. And then these two right here are really the proprietary parts of the system that set each of the APHIS companies apart. So I've worked on systems that have 100 servers designed in different ways. Maybe I've got you know 30 searching servers and 30 secondary matchers and five region servers and a few APHIS servers. It, it can be absolutely gigantic or it can be very small. This laptop actually has an APHIS on it. 
completely in a, a single package. All right, so that is the basics of the APHIS. Now we're going to do a little bit of a demonstration, okay? So you guys can see what's going on with the CSI stuff that people keep doing. All right. So this is my scanning station. I'm going to start by opening this up. And I need a volunteer for this. Who wants to scan their fingerprints? Come on up. John, what's your name? I'm Eric. Nice to meet you, Eric. You too. All right. So this is what the fingerprint scanning program looks like. All right. This one is specifically for a UK visas program. We're going to do a quick scan. We're going to scan his fingerprints. We're going to send it off to the server. We're going to get the result back. We don't care about the result in here so much, but this this is what we're doing for demo. So um, psh, that's not bad, man. You'll notice this this looks almost archaic. Um, like most industries that you guys may find yourselves in later, you'll see that the software that we use, the GUIs, are not cutting edge like what you see in the movies. All right, this is proven, it's been around for years, it works well, it's very stable, so this is what we use. Alright, so, let's start. Do a new transaction, and I'm going to say your family name is Eric. C or K? C. Alright. Good guess. Okay, so now we're going to scan. So, see how the uh, four green fingers are lit up right there? Mm -hmm. Use those four fingers and just place them on the scanner. Like that? Just like that. Now you see his fingerprints are showing up already. We're automatically detecting all four fingerprints with those green circles. And we're going to record that in the record. So now you can remove your fingers. And we're going to do the next one. This one? Yeah. The smudges that you see at the top are when the scan is very cold, it gets this effect called haloing. So it may have trouble finding it. So if you press a little harder, there you go. We're going to create a monster record. <laughs> I'll explain to you why this is a monster record in a little bit. All right, so here, I guess I need this side. Go ahead and put your thumb down, and we'll get the finishing touches on our monster. Yeah. Okay. It's also back. <laughs> All right. Oh, well. All right, so there we go. We have the entire <coughs> fingerprint record right there. So this is a, uh, a UK visa program. A visa program is capturing your fingerprints very quickly. We call it a 442 and you're done. If you are uh, a criminal, then what they will do is they will do your 4141 so that you can always keep them handcuffed. And then, um, <laughs> and then they will roll each finger one at a time and get a full rolled print. That gives you higher accuracy. Now, if we'd done that, it would have said, uh, wait a second, when you put your thumb down, it doesn't match the rolled thumb, and it would have complained that I got two left thumbs there. But our monster record doesn't know, so we don't care. Okay, so now we're going to take a facial image so that if this record comes back as a hit, and we have a completely different face than what they submitted it with, we're going to know. So, everybody smile. That's looking at me. Yeah, it's got you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Done. That's our, our uh, facial recognition algorithm right there. Okay. Everybody is smiling. Wow. I didn't think you guys are actually going to do that. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I think we're good to go. Okay. So we're going to create a record. We're going to put it in the queue, and it's going to send off to our APIS. All the, the back end stuff is currently running on a virtual machine that's running on this computer. So we don't have to worry about all the back end at all. Usually works pretty well. So, sending, sending. Eventually it's going to say sent, just like the one above it that I was testing with last night because I wasn't sure that the system worked and I wanted to make sure it didn't. And then um, we can actually go and look at it in the queue. Okay, so we're sent. We're done. So, if this were an actual scanning station, if this were the station here at Sonoma State, then in a few minutes we would get a result and it would say received. And we're good to go. We can tell, okay, is this a hit? Is this not a hit? So, let's go ahead and get out of the scanning software. And now we can go into the KFIS client. So back at the central office, this is what our fingerprint examiners are looking at. There may be a little bit scrunched on this screen, but we'll, we'll make this work. So 
what we're going to see is a queue of all the records that have been scanned. There's no image flashing. There's no magical overlaying of the fingerprint. I need to explain why that's just ridiculous, too. Because your finger is, is quite elastic. If it were brittle, it would shatter every time you touched anything. So you can tell, you can kind of move your fingerprint around, right? Well, every time you take a fingerprint, it's slightly different. So if you overlay it, it's just going to be a mess. If you have the exact same image, then someone's done something wrong. <laughs> All right, so here is our record, right? 10 13 2011. As you can see, this is our two left hands. If I go to the demographic information, there we are. Here's our <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's currently searching the 10 print database. In the background, it's doing all the searching, and eventually it will come back and say, okay, it's completed, and we can actually see if we got anything in the database. I have a feeling it may match the one that I did last night. We'll see. If it doesn't, then let's go out and commit some crimes. <laughs> YouTube, huh? Can, can we edit that before? <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. Sorry, he writes virus. Alright. Um, I will show you some of the other things that we can do. Okay, so if you get a bad fingerprint, then it's going to go to the state called perform quality check. Alright, so uh, one of the things that happens occasionally is that, um, so I did a system in South America. In South America, there was a lot of agricultural work. All right, so they were doing this, uh, this nationwide identification system, but these people have barely any fingerprints because they're out working in the fields, working with their tools all the time. So they're completely smooth, almost. So what may happen is it will go to quality check. And as you can see, down here in the bottom, this one has been you know, edited to only show that part of the print, but it's having a hard time finding out what fingerprint that is. So it's going to go to quality <coughs> check. If you don't have a lot of minutia, you see all these yellow points? All minutia. If you don't have a lot of them, then it's going to have some trouble. All right, so this looks like an upside down fingerprint from another person. All right, anyway, um, let's go ahead and see if there's any hits. Completed, hit confirmed. All right, so when I get a hit, because these are 10 prints, we're getting the entire thing. The computer can say, okay, yes, this is the one. If it's a latent print, which is a partial print taken from a crime scene or an area of interest, then we don't have the computer say yes automatically. It's, it's very dangerous. But let's see, you candidates. All right, let's find out. If this is really the same person. So. <coughs> All right. So what we're going to do is, I guess we can look. Can you guys see this? Okay. It's a little bit fuzzy, but this is frequently what fingerprint operators have to deal with. All right. So what we have here is the core of two prints. All right. Move that a little more. Maybe that's a little bit better. Okay. So here I have some prints. All right. Does everyone see this forty-three up here? This yellow box right there. Right here. It corresponds with this forty-three here. All right. So this is a matching minutia that we have. All right. Now that's not enough to convict someone or to say that yes, this is the correct person. We need, depending on the department that you're in, we need maybe seven, ten, fifteen matching points before we can say yes, this is the same person. So we look at that point forty-three. Okay, great. Now we're going to look at point twenty-one. See twenty-one right here. We're going to look on both prints and I'm going to say, all right, there's a distance of one ridge between forty-three and twenty-one over here. There's a distance of one ridge between 43 and 21 right here. This looks good so far. If I can do this seven more times, there's a very good chance that this is the same person. This is how our analyzers are going to tell that, yes, this is indeed our subject. That's how we get a hit. All right. 
Now, it's not always this easy. These are very good prints, very easy to follow. Also take a look at this scar here. You can tell all these ridges here are cut. This is either a scar or a fold, and you may have a few of those too. This one right here is a little bit damaged right here, so it doesn't help immensely for us. Is that the one? Is this the one? This looks like it. Oh, look, same scar. We're good to go. That's a rest of the guy. No, no, it is this area, isn't it? Yeah. Alright, yeah, I almost convicted him, and I wasn't sure that this was the guy we wanted to be <laughs> Be very, very careful. Okay, so I go on with point four, point forty nine, thirty nine. It's good to get them in a grouping, because if four points here match pretty well, and four points there match pretty well, if I've got one way the heck out here, then I've got a ridge count of like 60, and that's really hard to analyze. So I'm going to try and focus on a specific area and see if it's the same. Also, you may notice that some of this, it's a little hard to see, but you can see sort of some gray in the middle of the ridge. Some of those are actually pores. This is a 500 DPI image right here. If we were to scan at 1,000 DPI, and the 1,000 DPI scanner is like this big, so I didn't bring it, we could actually see the pores, and we can analyze the pores as well. We can use third level detail, which is pores, and there are a few other things like that. So we can actually cement our position that yes, this is indeed the right person. So that is the basics of fingerprinting. This is how we use computers in fingerprinting. Once we hit confirm yes, it sends a response off to the operator, the original one, and tells them either yes or no, this is the person, and we're good to go. So first I want to know if you guys have any questions, then I'll tell you some stories. Please. Um, what, what do you think about the... Uh Mythbusters episode where the guys uh, uh, defeated a fingerprint lock. Did they hit it? <laughs> uh, they actually used uh, three different methods, mm -hmm. all which used fake fingerprints to actually defeat a lock. It depends on the lock itself. Right. So there are a couple they, of they ways. They wouldn't identify it, what it was. Right. Now, if, if they're testing every lock in the world, then I'd say, okay, we need to rethink this technology. Uh, Cogent is, is currently putting out a new product that does a couple of things. First off, it tests to see if there's actually a finger behind the fingerprint. Mm -hmm. all right? It tests for the warmth, it tests for a couple of other things. And uh, load testing this was a pain in the butt. It is almost impossible to do that. Um, <coughs> second, it tests for a duplicate. All right, So one of the ways that you can actually crack a lot of fingerprints, uh, scanners, the old ones, and do they have any around here? Can we try this? If someone puts their fingerprint on there and goes in, if you lean up to it and just breathe on it, it will re-moisturize the sensor, and it may get you into the door. <laughs> um, and if that works, then it's their fault for not upgrading the system. I take no responsibility for that. If it's a coded system, that probably won't work, I hope. <laughs> so uh, it depends a lot on the scanner. Yes, there are ways to, to break them, but uh, the technology is getting better. Yeah. I also know that you can uh, create a fake fingerprint, but if you're doing things like Third level detail with pores, it's extremely hard to simulate a pore. They're tiny. Yeah? Um, you said that on a fingerprint there's a delta, which is the yes. triangle shape. I noticed I was looking at my fingerprint and it looks like there's two deltas on the thumb and one delta on the other four fingers. Is that up. true? Let's find out. Well, I don't know. I haven't seen your fingerprints yet. Let's, uh, let's find out. Come on up here. <laughs> No, no, we'll, just, we'll just scan it real quick, and then we'll, we'll take a look. Uh, while this is booting up, are there any other questions? Uh, what about the use of veins? That's also third level detail. Some scanners can actually detect the veins behind the finger and use those for matching. Um, that's a little bit trickier to scan. Um, <coughs> there are a few scanners that do additional things, like you can actually measure a fingerprint from a few feet away. Uh, some company just came out with a scanner that takes a three-dimensional image using HDR photography and different angled lenses and can take a picture of your fingerprint from like this far away for matching. Um, it's, it's very new in the industry. So it's not quite there yet. It's not prevalent in a lot of systems, but it's, it's coming up. Uh, there's one on Roger. Um, is, does your system show how many matches? 
Sort of. Did it saw to my my system is currently configured to send thirty candidates back. It doesn't send matches back, it sends candidates back. I have to tell whether or not it's a match. So uh, depending on the system, it may only send one per subject. It may send one per, per booking record. So I may have you know 30 back, and if it's a particularly naughty individual, I may get 30 cards back that are all that person's. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your name? Zach, Z-A-C-K. I can't believe you guys are so willing to let me just put that in there. That's incredible. <laughs> OK, so uh, instead of doing the, the four, go ahead and do the one you're interested in. Oh, just. Which one? Just all these. OK, so if you take a look. All right, over here, you actually have the accidental wall. It's almost exactly like that image. Did you make that image? <laughs> <laughs> Very similar. OK, over here, we have a loop. Right here, we also have a loop. Here's your delta down here. And if you move this one over a little bit more, we can see. But that is a, a very unique print right there. So Yeah, and then on the thumb. <laughs> yes, so what you have here is a double whirl, I would Looks like there's a delta there and a delta over there. Right. So it is a whirl. It's a circular print. But because you have that kind of yin-yang thing, I would call that a double whirl. Yeah, so okay. those are those are... I'm wondering now how unique it is because I've only ever seen loops and arches. I always thought whirls were the coolest thing, and I wanted all whirls back in the day. <laughs> 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 but it, it doesn't work that way. All right, sorry. Uh, I feel like yes. There's this episode of White Collar where a person would rub a stone on their fingerprints and it would just remove them for the day, and they right. do it every morning. Right. Oh, that doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. Um, if you don't like picking stuff up, that's really good. <laughs> your fingerprints actually act like the tread on a car. So you, you were constantly you know, sweating slightly, and it's not like pouring sweat off their hands and hands. I'm freak out about that. Um, <laughs> and they act like, like tread on the car to move the sweat and the oils and things like that out of the way so that you can pick things up. If you had completely smooth fingers, I would have a heck of a time picking this up. And if someone asked me to open a job, there's just no way I would stall it pretty much. So if you're really worried about that now, this right here is called a writer's point. When you write something, this is touching the table. This is going to hurt to remove. So we always capture this so that we can get you. So that's another way that, uh, that we can kind of sort of make that issue. I feel like we're, we're closing in on our time here. Maybe one more question? Story. Story. Story? OK, so I'll tell you about the monster record. I was in a particular European nation. Um, and the, the head of the police there <coughs> had been going around and testing all these, these stations, right? He would put his fingerprints in and they would send it off just to make sure that the connection it was great. Um, well, someone else took over for him. And so he was training the new guy how to do this. So they would go around and the new guy would put his fingers in. Well, once they tried doing one of each, like Eric and I did. Well, what happened was that now all of a sudden they had three hands in this one record. <laughs> <laughs> and then later, the new guy did both his hands. Now i got four hands in this record. <laughs> now here's a fun little bit. I have extremely clear fingerprints. All right, so when you, when you see my fingerprints, they show up. All right, that's going to hit, whoops, against almost anything. All right, so I always almost have one finger that matches against someone else's fingerprints. Well, I had one that matched against one of his fingerprints and one that matched against another of his fingerprints. And it was set to a two fingerprint threshold. So now we've got six hands. <laughs> well, then we had someone come in. Now, this is a live criminal record who had a fingerprint against me and a fingerprint against the original guy. So now I've got eight hands, and one of them's a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Over the course of the next couple of, of days, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even a week. It was like two days. We had absorbed 167 records into this monster creature record. It was just eating all the crime in this country. <laughs> so, it was kind of a pain. I had to go through and you know, separate everything out and figure out, okay, where did this start? Separate it, delete the, the nonsense records, and then get the criminal records back in the right spot. So, um, these are a couple of the, the things that we have to think about when we're actually designing a computer system, is that the computer system doesn't care if I use two different hands. It, it doesn't bother at all with checking on that. So, just a couple of things you've run into in the real world that you know you wouldn't think about when just designing this. You'd say, oh, yeah, ten fingers, let's go. No, not so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot.
Are you coming tonight? Uh, to what? Oh, yeah. It's we got an open mic. What is that? You don't make magazine news, right? Uh, you should go and look it up. Uh, it's awesome. I think so. Kevin, is your family going to let you come tonight? I didn't know. Yeah, we're hearing from him now. Oh, yes. So. Oh, gosh. It's, uh, we were getting this slack up. Well, it's not fair. 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 Yeah, it's the make and the, uh, the make cover story. So they, like, do all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff like that. Like, what time is it? It's the O'Reilly campus. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So we started using the You should come. And we configured it to reset the user. Oh, I've been to O'Reilly before. Like, what, what time the, is it at? It's at half 7. Half of the interns yeah, there are CX majors of the JC anyway. We need to exit. Okay. Right. Well, I might go. I don't know. You should. Just be fun. Yeah. Go for it. Your re-image is not going to have any kind of retaliation. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to ask you. Oh, they put it this could be a five-hour lecture. Yeah. We'll talk about yeah. <laughs> knuckle, knuckle knuckle prints. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I did knuckle prints once. Yeah, they, uh, they don't turn out well. Uh, um, lip prints as well. I haven't done lip prints yet. That would be fun. They may be wearing gloves, but they're drinking. Yeah. Do you want to eat something for a Oh sure. I need to use my little devices. Oh, what do you miss? I'll show you later. They're really cool. Doesn't matter, they replace everything. <laughs> <laughs>